have two presentations. The first one is this, the, the second one is uh, after lunch. And on the first one, we have decided to, to share with you the history of Lenovo. So the story will start immediately after this video, which I think will work here. Friendly organizing committee will immediately remediate the problem. So I'll let you watch this. VR, AR, MR, IoT, AI. Wow, we get it. You've never had more tools and opportunity at your fingertips. But all this new technology won't make a difference if it isn't designed to support your most important system. That's right, those special, unpredictable, wonderfully unique humans. You need to bring intelligent transformation to your business and the people who work there. At Lenovo, we're designing the systems that help each employee do more. Smart devices and software that transform the ways they collaborate. End-to-end -end security solutions that protect your data and your company's reputation from every angle and embracing AR and VR so they're not just buzzwords, but a new way to learn. The key to unlocking the full potential of your workforce and your bottom line, it starts with technology built to empower your people. Lenovo Solutions, designed for business, perfected for people. Powered by Intel Core Processors. All right, so you might love Lenovo and Lenovo has pretty much producing everything that is you can think of in the IT uh, world. So we're producing from phones, from PCs, laptops, software, servers, storage, integrated solution, infrastructure <coughs> service. So you name it, we have it as an offering for our customers and the enterprises. So, the story today that I want to tell you is, and the flow was going to go like this. First, I'm going to tell you where we stand at Lenovo today. Then I'm going to tell you the history of Lenovo, which is quite a young company. And behind this history are skills and decisions that are very important. And finally, I'm going to correlate this to what skills we expect from people that are coming out of university and people we hire. And this is a general understanding for all the IT companies right now. So let me start and tell you about Lenovo. So Lenovo has about 50,000 employees and we announced last week that we will exceed this year $50 billion in revenue worldwide. So we are leading the way in many of the things that are happening in technology. Now, we are present in 60 countries, but we do business in much more than this. We own more than 30 manufacturing capabilities. Some of them uh, are own, and some of them we are co-located with others. Uh, we have over 3,000 engineers, and we have three new artificial intelligence innovation centers. So we are spending over a billion dollars in the next three years into research and development in cooperation with leading universities in the world, as well as different other organizations, both governmental and private. Now, what does this mean? It means this. So Lenovo is mostly known to you because of the PCs and the endpoints. And that's a well done deal for us because we are number one. But there are other things that are hidden behind and you don't know. For example, our mobile phone division, which is the old Motorola division and bought from Lenovo. So we have sold devices which are in excess of 3 million in just 12 months. We are first in augmented reality and of course in PCs and tablets. So there are many things that Lenovo leads in both sales as well as technology. Apart from that, and on the, let's say, higher end of the things, 
We are number three in server market share worldwide, something that most people do not know. But we are number one in reliability over the last almost 10 years. So we are doing something different than everyone else. We are currently holding over 100 uh, world benchmarks in our data center group division uh, in everything from SAP to Microsoft to VMware, you name it, we have it and we believe we can be the best in this. And these numbers show it. Now let me tell you what the story is behind Lenovo. So the story begins roughly in 1984. Lenovo's name at that time was Legend and it was a small Chinese company. They were doing at the time about $2 billion in revenue. And about 80% of that was in China. So then in 2005, uh, our CEO decided that it was a good deal to purchase from IBM the personal systems division. So they moved and took out from IBM the entire thing. Research and development, supply chain, manufacturing, you name it. Whatever it was related to PC. So that was a very crucial uh, purchase for Lenovo. And I will show you immediately after what that meant for the company. Now in 2009, Lenovo decided to enter the mobile market, electronics. The third major acquisition and big bump came in 2014, just a few years ago, three or four years ago, when again Lenovo decided to purchase from IBM the entire x86 server division. Again, everything moved to Lenovo. At this time, IBM thought that there was no more uh, margins left in both PC and servers, so Lenovo took it out. All right? And the final one was just last year when we announced our strategic relationship with NetApp, one of the top two storage providers in the world, where we have a joint venture in China and the entire other world, we are reselling their products. Now, what did this do? In less than 15 years, Lenovo became a company from $2 billion into a company of $50 billion. A company of less than 3,000 workers to a company of 50,000 workers. So this is really an amazing story of strategic decisions made by people who led Lenovo throughout these years and are still there. So this is what we represent, a rapid growth in all segments that we operate, both PC, data center, and handheld mobiles. Now, along with this history goes a history of things that happen behind the scenes. And the first thing that happened behind the scenes are the technical stuff. So we are very proud that we have things that we did for the first time. And if I, so in the very old days, Lenovo, legend then, was the first company that created uh, a board that could uh, help the computer understand Mandarin. Is anyone talking Mandarin here or Cantonese? All right, that's good. <laughs> so then there were other significant contributions. So in 1992, the first ThinkPad, the first portable computer that had a color TFT. And then, if that thing works, and it does work, sorry about that. So I'll take it here. So Lenovo also was one of the first companies to integrate hardware components for security into their systems. The first ultra thin and ultra portable laptop. The first 360 degree hinge. Have you seen these laptops where the screen actually rotates 360 degrees and they become almost a tablet? That was the first one from Lenovo. 
and of course the first warm water cooling technology for servers. So we do have a lot of things to show, like the shutter spill uh, technology, which uh, prevents phones from screens from breaking, and also other things like motor modes, what I'll show you just a bit later, some skins that you put behind the phone and you enhance the, uh, the phone from projectors to cameras, even to something that measures your heartbeat. And finally, the last one, the pink shutter, a small shutter that closes off the screen, so absolute privacy is guaranteed. Now all these we did with our people, and I think this is something that relates to skill sets, and this is the things that I would like to share with you today. So although we have a global presence, we are dual headquarters. We are both headquarters in China and the United States. Development for us happens in the what we call triangle. So we have engineers in US, in China, and in Japan that cooperate in this. We are the only company that has 20 different nationalities in the top 100 executives of the company. This is really the secret behind the success of Lenovo so far. It hasn't been done before that a company in less than 15 years has gone from a revenue of 2 billion up to 50 billion. So this is the real power we have our people and our multicultural environment that differentiates us and allows us to operate with speed. Now, one other interesting fact is that almost one third of our workforce are women, which is unique in our age. We have all devices sold every second of any type. So you can imagine what happens in the background as far as supply chain and conformance to standards is going on. Now, going a bit forward, you know us from the PC and we are the number one PC company worldwide. Our ThinkPad X1 Carbon continues to be the sexiest, thinnest, and best portable that exists. So if you haven't seen it, we have it outside, come on and see it. It's the best portable that exists. Now, in gaming, we have our Legion brand that is also promoting and having a, a good way with the, the gamers everywhere. So this is what you would know mostly about Lenovo, but most of you would not know this. So Lenovo bought back uh, a few years the Motorola handheld set from Google back then, and we are actively promoting this. So we're the first one that uh, offered a 5G upgradable phone in the market. And we have our Z modes. As I told you, the Z modes are just backends that you put on a phone, and they give you different functionality. We have a projector, we have a camera, we have a battery. Uh, we have many other things that you can put on the back of the phone. So it's just an upgradable uh, setup for a phone. What most people don't know is that we have also entered some time ago the smartphone market. And we have a series of products and we are going very hard after those in which someone can purchase and automate their home. It is a booming market. And finally our data center. As I told you, we are number three in uh, server market share. We are number one in reliability. We have over 100 world uh, benchmarks on the um, server division. And of course, we have partnerships with everyone that is a software vendor. Some of the names you can see here. So these are the, you know, the entry point about Lenovo, where the history is, and where we stand right now. Now, the next one is to take you a bit further down and talk about uh, intelligent transformation and skill sets. And this is possibly the entry point. Now, I'm sure you've seen this many times. The explosion of data and how AI impacts whatever we're doing and how unstructured the data we're having everywhere are. Now, normally someone would have to talk now about AI, big data analytics, 
and cloud in order to, to complement. But I'll just take a moment and tell you the, the real underlying cause because I want you to correlate this with the skill sets that you have and we are looking. So the real underlying cause is the massivity, the scale of which things are happening right now. So we have massive access, massive scale, and massive speed. And I will give you an example of this by taking an example of a network operator. So you choose whatever, whichever you want, Vodafone, Orange, uh, Deutsche Telekom, anyone big, just to get a feeling of the kind of scale we're talking about. On the right side, you see what's happening inside the data center, which is not simple, but is manageable in terms of thousands. So there are one, two, three thousand instances of something that someone manages. As you move to the left, then you go to billions. So we're talking about massive access. These guys are building and building the systems for massive scalability. And of course, the speed at which things are operating is huge. What does that mean for you and for us? For you as an option going forward in the future, and for us also as an option selecting our technologies and our, and our go to market. So there are things that are happening, and instead of telling you about cloud and AI now, I'll tell you a bit later, these are the things that you should have in mind. Software defined things are taking over hardware. It's easier to create software than to create hardware. So that's why most people are actually interested and are working on software. This pushes down hardware into a commodity. So you see many different companies, take for example Nutanix, that are altering the way systems are built simply by software. So they are needing the simplest and cheapest hardware. The second one is the continuous beta model. I'm not sure if you're aware about that. But because of the speed and the capability we have right now, we can push out a product into a market in less than six months, not us, but everyone, and still be in slightly beta mode. You are expected to make small changes over time and the users understand that. So you put small patches forward, you, small small, you put small features forward in the lifetime of the product, of the product. The other one is the security concern. And this is a result mostly of the massive users. So imagine if there are 100 people accessing a system, it's very restrictive and you can control it. If there are 1 billion people accessing the system, can't do much about it. So security is a concern because of massive access. The final two points are probably the most important ones. As complexity increases because of the massive scale, there are new jobs, new disciplines that are created to handle complexity. So these are new opportunities for you and new opportunities for us. Finally, the brute force aspect. I'm pretty sure you know what that is, but this is the era of brute force. If you cannot solve a problem with 10 servers, then put 1,000. If 1,000 won't do, just put 10,000. At some point, you will do it. So we are now at this era that we have the capability to use sheer brute force. Now, what does it mean for us? For us, this trend translates to intelligent transformation. So it's cloud constructed by infrastructure, delivered by devices. So we are touching here three things, the endpoints, the business model, and the way you sell it. So for us, this is the blend, it's called intelligent transformation, that we are working towards. Now there are a few things here that are the, let's say, the building blocks of uh, intelligent transformation. I, go, I won't go into every one of those, but I just want to touch two of those. One is security. And security is not only on the product, it's also on the company, inside the company. 
So to trust the product, first you have to trust the company that creates the product. And to this, we are actually accelerating and creating, uh, let's say, a best of breed capability and processes. So we are the company which can be audited at any time, and we are happy to do so, to show the internal compliance we have and the structure we have in order to guarantee that we provide secure products to the market. The second one, and uh, a very important one, is the open collaboration. So you cannot go forward without collaborating with uh, the different partners, either hardware or software vendors, and opening to the, uh, to the public domain some code and getting some feedback behind that. So apart from this, there are other ways that we operate, but this is the main thing that we have in mind, our intelligent transformation, cloud, constructed, as I told you, by infrastructure delivered by devices. Now, this intelligent transformation has four aspects, skill sets, technologies, alignments, and business models. An example of a business model is cloud. Cloud is not a technology, it's a business model. You consume remotely what you don't own, and you pay for what you consume. This is a business model. There are technologies underneath that enable that. All right? What I would like to focus for the next slide, and just close up briefly, are skill sets. Now, let's talk a bit about advanced skill sets. I'm pretty sure that you know about this structure of skill sets. There you are. So, there are base skill sets, mostly technical for you and for us. There are soft skills that I'm pretty sure you know about. They are, everyone's talking about those, and there are advanced skill sets. Now, on the very base of those, there is a decision that you and us have to make. And the decision is breadth or depth. That means what? Do you, as a student or an early graduate, go to study several different disciplines and have breadth, or you go focus on one and have depth? This is a fundamental question both for you and for us. When you build a team, you need both. And some of those are quite difficult to find. Our system promotes depth. But it's quite interesting that companies require breadth. So, if you want to put it into a bit more words, let me give you this. So, the base skills you can all understand, and it's the basic stuff. So, you have to make appropriate decision about hardware, or software, or even specialization, or even a couple of those things. And this is what is expected by, by everyone. Then you go into soft skills. I'm pretty sure you've uh, heard about those. These are interpersonal traits, how well you can operate in a team, which is an important thing. Uh, how well can you perceive global mobility? So are you ready to take a bag and go to work to the US? Probably yes, probably no. One of the most important ones is structured reasoning. People want to know from other people they cooperate with that they have a structure when they think and they can reason with specific KPIs, with specific indexes. So this is something that can be learned and of course from an HR perspective, from a human resources perspective, is something that can be measured. But more importantly, on the advanced skills, we have the structured decision making. And make no mistake about that, when you enter a business, every decision that you will have to make will be about money. There is no decision that is not related to money. So there has to be a structured way of making decisions. And of course, you will have to understand finance to some extent in order to make these decisions. This is the most sought after skill in the market. How well can you structure your decision making? And I can have confidence that you make the right decision. Now, there are two other things that are very important that I would like you to keep. One is vertical 
expertise. This is also something very sought after in the industry right now. I can find an AI analyst, but can I find an AI analyst who is also a doctor or he is very well related and has experience in medicine so he can analyze something intelligently. This is something we miss. The last one is possibly the biggest opportunity for everyone. Services engineering. Now we have passed from an era of product engineering into something which is services because services offer a better opportunity to make money. But behind it there must be people who can articulate the service, design the service, make it reproducible and actually sell it. So if you want to bet your money somewhere and have an early retirement, I would most probably tell you to go to the right. And try and build throughout the, uh, the years you are in university or early after some of these goals. So that's about it for me, just to tell you uh, about the next presentation. I've decided to take four non-trivial examples and tell you about uh, technologies and at the same time tell you how one person inside Lenovo contributes to this. The first one is our supercomputing orchestration software, which is used in several uh, universities around the world. The second one is our infrastructure as a service offering, just to blend both finance and uh, uh, technology. And the last two have to do with endpoints and they are the security umbrella we have, which is called ThinkShield. And the last one is our workstation computing capabilities. I hope you find that this uh, presentation interesting and I hope to see you in the next one and discuss about these things. Thank you very much.